years, then we haven't even copyrighted our material. We allow people to copy it, to give it away. That's what we want. Wow. I think we're done with the show, guys. Let's shut her down. Is this the end of creation today? What will become of Eric Hovind? What will become of his hairbrush? Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Wow. I think we're done with the show, guys. Let's shut her down. Georgia just cleared everything up for us. Dr. Perdome just cleared it all up. Man, I, she said it really good, didn't she? In today's episode of Creation Today, Eric Covend and Paul Taylor were excited about a brief hallway interview with Dr. Georgia Purdom, someone you may be familiar with from Answers in Genesis. Georgia, as you may know, has a PhD in genetics. I mean, she really nailed that business about that we hear so often that chimps' DNA and human DNA is 98% similar. Yeah. It's true. Shortly after the International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium completed the human genome in 2004, the Chimpanzee Sequencing and Analysis Consortium completed a draft chimp genome sequence in 2005. The goal of the project was not to determine some kind of percentage similarity number, but rather to create a catalog of all these differences between chimp and human DNA to make an estimate of when the most recent common ancestor of the two species would have lived. The study identified 35 million single nucleotide changes, something called point mutations, and another 5 million insertion deletion events and various chromosomal rearrangements. We'll come back to these differences in a bit. And it's a joke, it's not. This study's a joke? I would love to have the faith to believe that it took place in seven days, but I have thoughts. <laughs> a piece of comedy fiction designed to elicit laughter? Whenever anybody tries to tell me that they believe it took place in seven days, I reach for a fossil and go, fossil. <laughs> or are the scientists who performed the study so incompetent that a man with no science education of any kind is forced to chuckle at the numerous and severe blunders? I can't be kind about this, because these people are watching the Flintstones as if it were a documentary. Her work must have been awful. The truth is, as she said, look, it's maybe less than 70% similar when you really look at it all. 70% when you really look at it? Sounds like we should take a look. Now, there may be certain aspects that are more similar than others, depending on what section of the genome you look at. So the people with the higher numbers are just looking at some sections? We better jump to what Georgia has to say. People claim we evolved from a common ancestor with the with the apes or with chimps. And the problem with that is, is a lot of people will use, I mean, there's lots of different things out there, but the one they'll use a lot is, well, where our, our DNA is so similar. But when you really look at it, it's not. It's probably less than 70% similar. And so um, you can't make the claim that we're 98 to 99% similar. It's just simply not factual. Georgia doesn't specify where she's getting her statistics from. But, as she works for Answers in Genesis, let's search for chimp DNA on the AIG website. The most recent article is from December 2015, so that must be the most recent scholarship on the topic. According to that article, in 2012, creationist scientists Dr. Tompkins and Bergman came up with an overall similarity of around 81%. I've heard of Dr. Tompkins. He works for the Institute of Creation Research. Here's the video on his bio page. Everyone hears that the chimpanzee genome is 98 to 99 percent similar to human. But what does that mean? And the one thing that I found out is that these estimates are based on isolated segments of DNA that we share with chimp that are very similar. It's not based on the whole genome. That sounds like a pretty serious problem in the research, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Tompkins says 81 percent but I want to find out where Georgia got that number of 70%. The next sentence says, other researchers have come up with an even lower percent similarity, averaging around 70%. There's Georgia's number. That's even lower than Tompkins. Let's find out who these other researchers are. Wait, what? The other researchers are Jeffrey Tompkins? AIG pitted two sources uh, against each other, and they're the same person? They didn't even bother putting glasses on him in one scene and no glasses in the other for Clark Kent effect. Despite the shell game, at least we finally have the source for this 70% similarity number. Comprehensive analysis of chimpanzee and human chromosomes reveals average DNA similarity of 70% by Jeffrey P. Tompkins on February 20th, 2013. Shannon, you're familiar with academic research methodology. 
What did you think of Tompkins' work? I read the research paper that Georgia is referring to here, and I'm not certain where to start. One of the most paramount tenets of scientific research is to provide a clear and fully transparent outline of one's methodological approach. Not only is Tompkins' materials and methods section suspiciously sparse, but he wastes 90 of his 350 or so words detailing the processing specifications of his computer. If you asked me for a recipe and I instead handed you the manual for my oven, you would probably think I'd lost my mind. The fact that Tompkins happened to use a CPU running at 3.8 gigahertz with 32 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM and a crucial 512 gigabyte SSD main drive containing a Debian 6.0 Linux operating system is about as relevant to his research methods and data analysis as my oven would be to the composition of the cake that I likely wouldn't be baking you because I'm a horrible at it. If I didn't know any better, I'd think perhaps he was looking for some fancy, technical-sounding filler to distract from the fact that he omits two fairly important components in his materials and methods section. First, it's missing any semblance of a detailed outline of the mathematical algorithm and program he constructed to analyze the data. And second, at the very least, a copy of the data table itself. Instead, he sees fit to include mundane jargon about how he exported that data into Excel CSV format. Without transparency of what he was looking at, how he was looking at it, and why the method of analysis he used is valid, any conclusions drawn from it must be taken on faith. Leaving aside the literally mesmerizing scale of negligence of the omission of his methods, he proceeds to cite himself as a source five times in his research. There are just a minuscule 14 citations total in this paper. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I own a calculator. And what that tells me after careful and meticulous use of the division button is this. Just shy of 36% of the supporting research holding up his methodology and conclusions is his own. If more than a third of your ground research was conducted by you, you have run a really serious risk of being accused of bias. While it isn't unheard of to cite yourself as a resource, if your current paper is a continuation in your area of study, or if you've made a previous discovery that breaks new ground in a field, what is egregious, dishonest, and manipulative is the total misrepresentation of the research of another scientist to further your own claims. I took a look into the external resources that Tompkins cited and found such a case in his very first citation. In his introduction, Tompkins promotes an inference that there is great doubt emerging amongst primate evolutionists regarding the actual similarities between the chimpanzee and human genomes. To prove the legitimacy of his assertion, he cites a single reference. This reference is from an abstract written by Dr. Todd Prouse in a case study he published in 2012 titled Human Brain Evolution from Gene Discovery to Phenotype Discovery. In that abstract, Dr. Prouse makes the following statement. It is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees are far more extensive than previously thought. Their genomes are not 98% or 99% identical. When left in isolation and primed by Tompkins' preamble, this is a damning statement. If an expert in primate evolution has such disparaging things to say about primate-human genome similarity, maybe Tompkins has a point. There's only one way to find out for sure. I read the actual paper. In the first paragraph of Dr. Proust's case study, where he compares scientific research from over 100 cited sources, I found this. Humans possess species-specific genes. As a result of the numerous tandem duplications of chromosome segments that occurred in human evolution, and also recombination events, one consequence of the numerous duplications, insertions, and deletions is that the total DNA sequence similarity between humans and chimpanzees is not 98% to 99%, but is instead closer to 95% to 96%. Although the rearrangements are so extensive as to render a one-dimensional comparison overly simplistic. Dr. Prouse has a PhD in biological anthropology from Yale. His focus in his role as an associate professor at York's National Primate Research Center at Emory University is the study of the evolution of the human cerebral cortex. His case study is sound. 
and he raises some valid questions, specifically about the comparative analysis of genes used in the formation of language and how they are represented on the chromosome. But it is not the damning condemnation of human and chimp DNA similarities that Tompkins makes it out to be here. Quite the opposite, in fact. It's a call to scientists to do more analysis into the comparisons between the two genomes so that we can better understand the nuances of cortical evolution. Now, I've mentioned that I'm not a scientist, but I do have a degree in psychology. I went to university and I've studied methodology and inferential statistics extensively, and I see issues here that wouldn't be acceptable for even a freshman submitting this report in a first-year intro course. In order to create a legitimate artifice around his research, Tompkins misrepresents the research of others, doesn't clearly define his methodology, circumvents transparency of his data, and does inadequate background research. I implore you all, before placing any validity on this type of research, take a critical look at how it's compiled, conducted, and presented. Be an advocate for your own understanding and resist the urge to assimilate this just solely for reaffirmation. That's good advice. And but yet, what the story that's told to the public is this other similarity because they're only taking into account one type of difference, not all the types of differences. So that's one of the biggest problems that we have right now. Um, and so it's clear that we're not, even from a genetic standpoint, we're not biologically related. Okay. Methodology criticisms aside, does Tompkins' claim of 70% have merit? How is it that he came up with such a different number? Eric already alluded to some portions of the DNA seeming more similar than others, and to looking at the whole thing. Tompkins' bio made similar insinuations. It's interesting that Georgia asserts that only one type of difference was taken into consideration. You may recall the Chimpanzee Consortium cataloged three different types of changes. First, single nucleotide changes. Second, insertions, deletions, called indels. And thirdly, chromosomal rearrangements. Consider these two sentences. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quack brown fox jumps over the lady dog. There are two letters different, the A in quack and the D in lady. Both the secular study and Tompkins would agree that there are two differences here, analogous to single nucleotide changes. Now consider these two sentences. The word brown appears twice in the second sentence, likely a single insertion event of the extra word. When looking for a count of mutations that account for differences, as the original study was, the five new letters would rightly be considered just one change. If looking for percent similarity, these five new letters could be considered five changes, or one, depending on how conservative one wants to be. But the difference in Tompkins' methodology was far more arbitrary than philosophical. He told the software to stop matching segments as soon as any gap is encountered. In this example, Tompkins would match the quick brown, encounter a gap, and so completely stop performing any further comparison. Tompkins would call these sentences only 33% similar. The same is true of deletions, the second type of indel. In this second sentence, the word brown has gone missing. This would normally be recorded as a single deletion event or a five-letter difference, depending. But again, Tompkins gives up all matching at the first gap. So the quick is all he counts as similar, never even considering the fox jumps over the lazy dog. His method calls these sentences only 23% similar. By Tompkins' method, if you took two identical books and tore the first page out of one, you would determine that the two books have 0% similarity. Not exactly a useful method of counting. As bad as this deliberate gap-skewing problem was, it turns out there was an even bigger flaw in Tompkins' 70% study. In 2014, Glenn Williamson of Sydney, Australia set out to replicate the findings using the same BLAST software Tompkins used. BLAST is the basic local alignment search tool it allows you to take a sequence and search a large database to find sequences that are related to the sequence that you input. Curious at getting drastically different results, Williamson learned that some older versions of BLAST had a bug when the user submitted a large number of query sequences all at once. A user submitting 100,000 sequences would receive matches for only 75,000 of them. However, a user submitting the same 100,000 sequences one at a time would receive matches for all 100,000. Naturally, Tompkins' study was conducted with the version of BLAST with the batch processing bug. Williamson reran all the sequences in the updated version of the software and received a 96.9% .9 match between human and chimpanzee genomes. He put all of his findings into a paper and submitted that paper to Answers Research Journal in September 2014. I had the opportunity to speak to Williamson personally, and he was kind enough to send me a copy of his paper. Because unsurprisingly, Answers and Genesis didn't print it. 
For some reason, Tompkins himself was assigned to review the rebuttal to his work. Not exactly an unbiased editor. After a year of Williamson pestering for a response, Answers Journal instead printed a retraction of sorts, acknowledging the software bug and mentioning that it was Williamson who notified the author of the situation. Without impact from the batch processing bug, Tompkins now determined an 88% similarity between chimp and human DNA. That is a far, far cry from 70%, but still slightly short of Williams's 96% that matches the general scientific consensus. Why the difference? Because Tompkins continues to insist on using misleading, arbitrary, ungapped scoring that helps his narrative, but is ultimately devoid of any real-world meaning or application. While it was good for Tompkins to acknowledge this problem, one has to wonder why Georgia and the rest of the Answers in Genesis team continue to tout this 70% number when the creationist researcher who generated the number has since retracted it. The AIG posting of the 70% article has no link or mention to the correction at all. Why not? The most recent article on AIG's website still points its readers to the non-redacted story. Why? This is a this is an this is a worldview issue. This is a presuppositional issue. It's not about the evidence. The evidence is clear. Romans 1:20 tells us that. I always say, if it was about the evidence, everybody would be a creationist because God says the evidence is clear. Does the Bible saying that the evidence is clear somehow actually make the evidence clear? If it's a worldview issue, why do so many Christians look at the evidence and conclude that God must have used evolution to create things? Surely they're looking at the evidence with the same worldview that you are, Georgia. But Romans 1.18 says that people suppress the truth in unrighteousness, and so that's what's really going on here is a suppression of the truth. I would have to agree that suppressing the truth is unrighteous, but the only suppression I see is layers of deliberately misleading and downright dishonest representation of facts, data, and the work of researchers. Whether chimps are 96% similar to humans or only 70% similar should ultimately make little difference to someone who's advocating that all similarities are explained by a common designer. Georgia gave us two Bible verses, so I'm going to leave us with two more. For Eric, Georgia, Dr. Tompkins, and everyone involved. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21-22 Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If the truth is really on your side, why would you cast any kind of doubt by using practices that are even remotely dishonest, remotely deceitful, that are anything other than scientifically rigorous and methodologically pure, so that no one could question it? If anyone should have the confidence to be completely transparent, would it not be those with an omnipotent God on their side? If you need to lie to protect your God, you don't serve much of a God. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please click on the subscribe button and maybe tap that notification bell so that you'll be kept up to date with the latest apology of videos, be they science or answers in Genesis reaction videos. Once again, let me give a huge thank you to all my Patreon patrons. It's your help that makes this channel possible and my ability to increase both the quality and quantity of the content. If you're willing and able to join them, please check out patreon.com apologia. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. Later.